What's cracking guys, in this video I'm covering this super exciting paper called ETA prediction with graph neural networks in Google Maps. So uh, it's yet another application of graph neural networks in a like a real world uh, setting. Uh, so previously on this channel I've covered PinSage, so that's uh, another application of GraphML to the recommender system application. And here we are using it to predict this. So ETA stands for estimated time of arrival. Uh, I mean, you probably already knew that if you have ever used Google Maps and uh, basically as you can see it's running at production setting at Google Maps and they achieved some awesome results so basically uh, our GNN pro uh, proved uh, powerful when deployed significantly reducing negative ETA outcomes in several regions compared to the previous production baseline up to 40 plus percent in cities like Sydney uh, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here into this map here and you can see the results are pretty awesome. Like in Sydney, they achieve uh, like 43%. And as you can see, it's very dependent on the geography. So in some cities like this Taichung city, it's up to 51%. In Europe, it seems to be a little bit lower compared to these in, uh, like increases here. And I guess it has a lot to do with the topology of the place, with the data available, because obviously uh, this is going to be trained in a supervised setting, uh, even though they experimented with some unsupervised uh, methods. And we're going to see those details a bit later. Uh, but yeah, it'd be funny to kind of analyze and understand why the why these variations in the in the improvements. But that's uh, like something that's outside of the like uh, scope of this paper, obviously. Okay, so let me just motivate the the whole paper and kind of explain the problem if it's not already clear enough. So basically, we have uh, you have a point A, so that's your starting point, and you have uh, like a point B, so that's your end point. And basically what like Google Maps does is one of like one of the modules of that application is going to source like a feasible routes from A to B. So something like this, A to B, and then like a third path, maybe like this. And then this system is going to like estimate ETA for, for all of these routes. So ETA or estimated time of arrival. And that basically means how like long does the system expect your travel to last from A to B. And basically, once you have that information, uh, Google Maps can kind of sort, like, uh, sort basically all of these routes according to ETA and suggest you the, the shortest routes, uh, like time-wise, shortest. Maybe they're longer, like physically, but like there, you'll be, you'll get quicker there, pretty much. Okay, so that's uh, hopefully uh, the problem is now clear enough. Now let's see uh, how this is uh, like a posed as a as a graph ML problem. So I think it's pretty clear, but. Let me let me kind of explain that. Um, and the, the part that's super interesting is how they constructed graphs. So it's not that intuitive, and this is not something I'd expect. But yeah, so I guess if you had like a, like a street here, and you had some intersection here, and then you had another street here, and you had another street here, I guess the way you'd model uh, this thing. So if you had, let's say, we have another intersection here. So how you would model it is basically how I just like uh, draw it down. So you have this, these would be nodes. So the intersections would be nodes. And then you'd probably have like the whole street would be an edge between two nodes. And I guess once you think about it a bit more deeply, it makes sense that I mean, if this is like two kilometers, you don't want to have that as a single edge. Whereas like some other streets may, may be like 20 meters or something. So it makes sense to kind of segment the roads themselves into nodes. So that's exactly and precisely what I did here. So as you can see here, they segment the roads into these segments. And they, so this is called a segment. Let me just get the like terminology out there. So this is a segment. And this whole thing here is called a super segment. And you can then like going from here to here, you can see that these things, so the segments will be nodes and the edges will, will exist between the uh, like obviously segments that are connected. So something like this. So this would be like a, like a graph. And finally, you can see that on the third like chart here. And so that's the, the final super segment. And that's the unit that the graph, uh, like the graph neural network will be consuming. So uh, obviously, if you're not familiar with graph ML, I have a whole playlist, you can check it out. Uh, I'll link it somewhere here. Uh, but basically, uh, what is needed here is you, you I mean, with, a, with every machine learning algorithm, but like here as well. So you want to associate certain features with all of these nodes. And that's precisely what I've done. And so once you have a graph, once you have the features, then you just need a graph 
and then and you can basically predict uh, the like time it takes to traverse a certain segment. So what the graph neural network is going to do is, given as an input this this uh, super segment, it's going to predict among other things, it's going to predict how long does it expect once you enter. So once you enter here, how long does it take to e exit here? So that will be like a node level prediction, but the system is also going to predict how long does it take if you enter here, how long does it take you to exit here? So all of those predictions are going to be made by the GNN. So let's slowly start digging into details so you can understand the, the, like the like specifics of this whole pipeline. Uh, first things first, we've got uh, like features. I mentioned those, and here are some of the features they were using. So, the actual no. By the way, this is these are labels. So the actual traversal times along segments and super segments in seconds are used as node level and graph level labels for predictions. So hopefully now it's clear. So you have some graph, and the labels are basically the, the amount of seconds that it takes to traverse the segment or traverse the super segment, and all of that data is obviously collected by like Google Maps throughout the last many years, and so they they got the data available. So that's something that's given. Uh, and now the features. So on a segment node level, we provide the average real time and historical segment traversal travel speeds and times. So both the speeds and times uh, are, are like ingrained in the feature vectors, as well as segment length and segment priority. Like is it a road classification? Is it a highway? Is it an intersection? I guess like all of that is provided as features. And so I won't be digging into details here, obviously, like uh, on a high level, you, you can understand that here, we've got some domain specific knowledge, uh, like that's uh, basically uh, injected into these feature vectors. And the other important thing is that we additionally provide learnable segment and super segment level embedding vectors. So that means that these vectors here are going to be a concatenation between uh, all of the features we just saw, like the length of the road, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And the second part is going to be learnable. So we will have a learnable portion of those vectors. Okay, so that's that's how I understand all of this. Okay, what next? Once we have labels, we have data, we, we know how graphs are formed, uh, we need a GNN, obviously. And uh, the model they are using here is graph network. So that's a paper that came out of DeepMind as well. It's a super generic framework. You, you, you can see the equations here. So these are the uh, basically uh, update equations for the edges, for the nodes, and for the, this uh, like uh, basically graph level embedding. And these are some uh, like basically aggregation functions again for edges uh, and for for nodes. And uh, let me try and break them down so that you have a feeling uh, what's going on in here. So. Let me draw a simple graph here. So I have a node here. Let me draw a couple more nodes. So something like this. And we've got some edges. So there's going to be an edge here, an edge here, an edge here, maybe an edge here. So uh, this is the update rule for, for the edge. And basically this phi, what I've used in practice, is a simple MLP. So it's a multi-layer perceptron, nothing fancy there. So what happens is you take the edge feature. So this is this is an edge and you've got some features there. Uh, and so basically, you take those features, you put them in here, and you probably concatenate those features with the next thing. So you, you concatenate those features with the source node, with this one and with the target node. So basically the two nodes that the edge is connecting with. So those are the, this is the source and this is the target uh, nodes features. And you just add this uh, global, this is a global feature vector that's basically associated with the graph itself. So there is a, some like a separate feature vector out here that's being updated together with this graph uh, like features. And so once you concatenate all of, the, all of that data and you kind of pass it through the MLP, that's the update and you get a novel edge representation, which is uh, like uh, denoted here as E prime. And very similarly, you do it for nodes. So you have a, so you basically have a node here. Let's focus on this one. So what you do, as you can see here, you concatenate its features again with this global thing, global feature vector, and you additionally add this aggregated like vector that's formed precisely in this manner. So this way, okay? What you do is, and the, these are simple summations. So just when you see this, think in O1, you can think of it as a summation. So what you do here is you basically take all of the incoming and outgoing edges, uh, and you just kind of sum up their features of those edges, and that's this vector, and then you concatenate it here, and you use an MLP to produce a novel uh, representation for this node, okay? Hopefully that's clear enough. 
So in, in this particular case, there's going to be this edge, there's going to be this edge, and it's going to be this edge. And finally, you're updating this global feature vector. Again, you use its own features, you use uh, like basically the aggregated versions of edges and nodes. Now you basically take all of the edges and all of the node features, and you just basically sum them up I guess you, you may need to do some kind of uh, like me, like uh, averaging there, but basically you, you kind of combine them and you concatenate them, pass them through the MLP and you get a novel representation here. And that's it, you just rinse and repeat. Usually uh, GNNs are very shallow, so you won't be doing this like in CNNs like 150 times like in ResNets. You'll be doing this a couple of times, two, three times, and we'll see that in this paper in particular, they are only doing it two times. Okay. So that's a high level overview of this uh, GN block. And now let's see what else. Um, so uh, as a quick recap of GN architecture, it's fairly simple. Again, you have a graph here, I'm gonna denote it as a this blob. And then you have an encoder block here. So something like this. So this is encoder. Then what they do is they, uh, once you encode the, these raw features into your latent space, you have this processor like part of the of the pipeline, which is basically your GNN, and you apply like this logic you just saw here a couple of times, and then you take those latent representations which are now refined, you pass them through the decoder, and the decoder will finally uh, output all of the predictions you're interested in. So that's it on the high level how this GN uh, like pipeline looks like. They mention it also here, so we compose three GM blocks into an encode, process, decode architecture, and learn a separate model for each horizon H. Uh, these blocks are defined as blah, blah, blah. I'm going to return to this thing in a second because it's very important, this horizon detail, but I'm, I'm gonna first kind of like explain this thing uh, in a bit more detail. So the encoder is first applied to the super segment S with the previously described raw features. So those were the, as we saw, the speeds, the, the time, the, the, the additional like learnable embeddings, those are the raw features. It produces latent representations of nodes, edges, and the super segment itself. So that's the U component. So that's the, this is the super segment, segment representation. Um, these latents are then passed to the processor, which is applied two times with shared parameters, so there is additional sharing of the parameters here, uh, to update these representations. Finally, these representations are transformed into appropriate predictions by applying the decoder. So again, this is going to output the, um, basically, uh, both node-wise as well as graph level predictions of how long does it take to traverse a segment or a super segment. Those are going to be outputs. We'll see, soon see a bit more details there, but yeah. Uh, now, getting back to the horizon detail. Uh, it's very important because what they do is uh, they basically for each region of the world, because you, you obviously can't train a single system that will work everywhere. What they do is like focus on some specific region, like take Serbia, that's my home country. I'm gonna take Serbia as an example and I'm gonna draw something that looks like Serbia, but not exactly. And so this is Serbia uh, and basically uh, you train a single uh, GNN for this region. So for Serbia or even some like, like a small, smaller, like a, part of Serbia. And you additionally train uh, a GNN model for different horizons. So that means uh, what they were using was uh, 0 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and finally 60 minutes, so an hour. So they're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 GNNs for a specific region. So why is that? Uh, well, the reason is uh, this like zero GNN, let, let me call it that way, uh, is basically going to is basically going to predict uh, the time it takes to traverse this particular segment right now. Whereas when you input uh, like a graph, a super segment into this one, it's going to predict what the traversal time of that super segment is going to be or segment in 10 minutes. Uh, and by analogy, this one will like tell you like how long does it take to traverse a segment or a super segment in 20 minutes, 30 minutes and one hour. Uh, and they just figure out experimentally that that's, uh, that leads to much better performances and that's what I stick with. So yeah, this was Sir B, uh, okay, something like that, nice. Um, let's see what else. So once we have, we know how the graph is structured, we know how the, the graph neural network is structured. Now let's see how the actual loss functions look like. And a loss function, uh, at least the one they're using in production, they also experimented, and we'll see those details in a minute, with some other losses here, which are unsupervised, so basically unsupervised, 
and soup. And uh, so this is used in production. Basically, there are three components. One component is this SS, which is basically super segment. One component is S, which is segment level prediction. And one component is this uh, segment but cumulative prediction. We'll see what that means in a second. So here is how the super segment loss is formed. You iterate over different super segments. You have this normalization part, which I'm going to explain in a second. And you have your Huber loss over here. So Huber loss, for, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is very simple. And it's supposed to kind of prevent certain outliers for, for, from like destabilizing the training. So it looks like basically like a parabola uh, in a certain range, which is denoted by delta and minus delta here. And then you basically have just a linear extrapolation here. So here you have a linear function. So it's not a parabola here. It's not going to be like this. It's going to be a simple linear function there. And so the gradients remain constant. They are not increasing. And so this kind of stabilizes the training when you're updating the gradients. Uh, if you watch my uh, DQN video or checked out my project on GitHub about DQN, uh, that's, that's, I think, the only place I've seen Huber loss uh, being used so far. But I guess it's a, it's a neat technique to have in your toolkit whenever you want to kind of stabilize the, the update procedure. Uh, so. So this 400 basically means this delta is 400. And uh, so the main part here is this means uh, this is a prediction, uh, like a super segment level prediction at time t with horizon with the model of that has a horizon h. So if we had the model, if we were training the model with the horizon zero, you can just ignore this. So we are predicting, uh, we have the ground truth here. So this is the GT label. So this part is the GT. So this is from the data set that the Google Maps team collected. And this will be your actual prediction on a super segment level. And so basically you just do uh, this Huber loss over it. And that's that's it. So for the normalizing uh, normalization component, I owe you an explanation there. So this flow, basically tells you the following thing. So this flow of i is how long does it take to traverse this super segment i when there is almost no traffic on the road. And uh, the, the kind of reasoning behind it is, so imagine if you have a super long, uh, like a super segment, uh, and uh, that means that these errors are probably going to be larger because you, you, there is so much more like uncertainty when you have a lord, larger like uh, a route, right? And so what you do is kind of normalize with these, this uh, like zero time or basically the, 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 the time it takes to traverse it when there are no cars in there, uh, no traffic. And so that's kind of the intuition. So the bigger the road, you want to kind of normalize it by its this flow time. Uh, similarly for segments, so you additionally just have uh, here, as you can see, you have this iteration over the segments of the super segment. So M, uh, this index I means the amount of segments in that super segment. And you do, do the same procedure, basically. And finally, you have these cumulative segments. So what they do is, let me let me kind of jump back here. So uh, it will tell you, if you're here right now, it's going to tell you how long did it take to get up to there. So it won't tell you the traversal time from here to here. It's going to tell you the cumulative time from here all the way here to here. And then for, for this one, obviously, you're just going to include this one as well, and etc. So that's the, the whole point there. Okay, I think we're pretty much done with the method. Uh, there is two more details fairly important for the production setting. Uh, gene enhance and all, that's all nice, but like at the end, uh, you gotta make the thing work. And uh, what I noticed is that as they were dumping models across every single epoch, the predictions that came from those models were like varying a lot. So there was a, like a, a large amount of variance there. And so they, they used basically two methods to uh, dampen out those oscillations to kind of reduce the variance. Uh, one is uh, using this meta gradient method and the second one is using this uh, exponential moving average method. And this, you've seen this if you watch my previous videos, uh, like su self-supervised learning field uses EMA a lot to form the teacher networks, etc. Uh, but basically, let me let me first quickly explain meta gradient. I won't be digging into details here, but like the whole idea is uh, instead of uh, picking a learning rate and some schedule, 
you basically treat learning rate as a hyperparameter itself, and you jointly optimize the learning rate alongside the model parameter. So this is what these fancy formulas are telling us. We're basically also updating this 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 is learning rate parameter uh, using the loss function. So this is just a generic setup of meta gradient. That's why they're using this new this Greek symbol. But in this particular application of this paper, uh, new is uh, basically learning rate. And so you are tuning those as well during the training. And the second thing is uh, they're using EMA, as I said. So basically, what you do, you you take when you're update when you update the uh, GNN, you don't just use those weights as as the new weights. What you do is instead you take this previous weights, which is the uh, EMA accumulative estimation of of weights. You kind of weight it with this parameter, and they've used 0 0.99 here. That's again a hyperparameter. They they just figured out that that number works well. And th these are the novel weights. And so as you can see, so this is kind of pulling uh, these novel weights towards this stable estimate of the weights that was uh, created through snapshots, multiple snapshots in, 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 the, in the history, I guess. That's pretty much it. That's the, the whole method. Uh, and now I'm going to slowly start explaining the experimental setup. Um, I'm going to show you the results. And yeah, for showing you the baselines they're going to compare with, let me just quickly just uh, mentioned this part. So they, they mentioned that we know that November 2020 data may be susceptible to COVID-19 traffic patterns, and hence we attempted to select regions that minimize this deviation for evaluation in order to capture performance under regular traffic conditions. So the thing is, obviously, because, because of the COVID, the traffic patterns have changed, and so they are kind of trying to find the regions where uh, even post COVID, hopefully, uh, they'll have uh, relevant results. And so my question is, how do they actually find the regions that minimize this deviation? Uh, there are no mentioning, uh, they haven't mentioned this in the paper, but I, I'd love to know the answer. So if somebody somehow uh, knows that, uh, feel free to comment down in the comment section. Okay, having said that, let me show you the baselines they're they are using. So first baseline is super simple. It's basically real time travel times. So what you do is the following. So you have a segment. So you have one segment. And I'm just going to draw it here as a square, but it basically represents this thing here. So one of these segments. And so what happens is the following thing. So they have over the last uh, like two minutes or five minutes, they have the data of what were the traversal times uh, of the cars and vehicles in general passing through that segment. I mean, they say it here nicely. Summation of segment level travel times computed using segment speeds averaged over a two minute window prior to the time of prediction. So you basically take the data, the recent data, the last two minutes, and you use that as a as a weight, as a predictor. So what happens basically is you, you find that average for this segment, then you find the average for the next segment, you find the average for the next segment, and if this was the whole super, like a super segment, uh, the, the predictor would just sum up these average numbers. So the, let, let's call this T1, T2, T3. You just basically take and sum them up to get the final value. So T will just be basically a sum of all of these TIs. Where individual TIs for this particular segment, you use the last two minute data and compute it. So this is a non-parametric model. You don't have a neural network. You don't have any fancy ML models. You just have non-parametric method there. Uh, fairly simple with historical travel times baseline. What you do here instead of using the last two minutes, uh, like basically you can use both the uh, future and past information, but in the like last days. So for example, uh, if this if we're trying to uh, predict like what is going to what is the travel time of a super segment at 4 p.m. What they're going to do is take a look at the 4 p.m. So let me just kind of draw this as a timeline. So 4 p.m. is here. So they're going to take the data over the last, I don't know, like 15 minutes maybe here and 15 minutes here. And they're going to take a look at like what those times were like uh, last week and the week before and etc. And they're going to combine and average out that data over the last some weeks. So they say here average across uh, last 17 weeks. So that's how you form the predictors predictions here. So that's how, so you have you use the historical data to form these TIs and then you again just sum them up to get the final T. Uh, finally, deep sets is uh, like the last uh, method. This is a model based uh, approach. So this is not so this is parametric method. 
and uh, the thing is it's ignoring the graph structure. So if you have a super segment, what, what this method is going to do is the following. Let me kind of go up there, it's going to be easier to explain. So this method is going to pass this through an MLP, pass this through an MLP, pass all of the segments through an M MLP, then it's going to like kind of aggregate all of those maybe using summation and then it's, it's going to pass that final representation so we have a final representation here which is formed as I said by aggregating all of these feature vectors of all of these segments and then you just pass it to another MLP here to get the final representation and then you can do the predictions. So as you can see here you're treating this as a bag of words in a way. You're just taking all of those features, feature vectors of the segments, you're kind of uh, ditching the graph data, the graph information of how they're connected and you just kind of aggregate them and then you form the predictions. So that's the deep set. Uh, having explained deep set I realized I have not uh, explained how the actual inference uh, looks like once we have this uh, this uh, GNN model trained. So let me explain that in a second. Um, Basically, this is how the serving looks like. Once this app, once this model is running in production in your Google Map application, this is how you're actually getting the results. So imagine you have a route from A to B. So you have route from A to B. And A and B are connected with three super segments. So we have like something like this. A is connected via segment one, two, and three to the segment, to the actual destination B, okay? So what you do here, and this is going to make uh, the uh, reason behind using the horizon models um, like more clear, hopefully. So what happens is you take, so we are at time t, and you basically take, take the, this segment one, and you use the model that has the horizon equal to zero, and you do a prediction, and that is going to give you t1. So that's basically the estimated, the predicted time, what the model is expecting, how long do you need to, to kind of traverse this segment one. So once you have T1, let's imagine T1 is 12 minutes. So this is 12 minutes. 12 minutes, okay? So once you have 12 minutes, uh, then what you do is out of the pool of the horizon models, so that means, as I said, we have the 10 minute model, the 20 minute model, the 30 minute model. So we are, because we are 12 minutes, we're going to take the models that have horizon 10, so I'm going to denote them as horizon 10, and you're going to take the model that has horizon 20, so that's horizon 20 like this. And now you're going to take those models and pass the segment 2 through them. So H10 is going to tell you how long does it take to traverse segment 2 in 10 minutes from now. But since we have 12, we are actually expecting 12 minutes, that means we're going to do basic interpolation here. So this one is going to tell us the result, let me call it T two at 20 and this will be t2 so that's the second time it takes to traverse the second segment according to this model 10 and you're going to combine this two informations simple interpolation to form the actual time it takes to traverse the data so it's going to be somewhere between these two numbers right and so once you have the t2 you can use the t2 and t1 you can add them up and then do the same procedure for segment super segment three and rinse and repeat until you get to the end point B. So yeah, hopefully uh, that's now it's clear how you're using this model in inference. Now let me get back to the uh, where we stopped. So I explained the deep sets. That's the third baseline. Now let's see the actual results. Uh, here, they're, they're by, by the way, they're using this uh, RMSE metric uh, to to kind of uh, compare the baselines. And you can see here, it's very simple. You basically take the super segment level predictions, you do the like summation over the super segments and you do a square and you average here. Yeah, basically root, mean, square, there. It's pretty pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and so here are the results. Uh, you can see the real-time baseline, the historical, the deep sets baseline, and the GN baseline. And you can see that it's, they, they also show it's a significant, statistically significant result. Uh, and it's lower compared to all of the other baselines, which is cool. So the thing that initially uh, kind of bugged me here is that if you take a look at the numbers, the differences are fairly trivial, like small, compared to the other baselines. So DeepSet seems to be performing really well. So why the whole hustle? Like why, why, why are we using the graph data? And I'm gonna get to that in a second, but like, let's see here. If we compare these numbers, like, Take this number, you can see it's way 
worse compared to these two models. So these two are out of the question. That's obviously uh, like clear, but like between deep sets and GN, uh, what should we use? And I mean, it's a bit better, but is it like worth it? And the, the thing is one important note here, they, they mentioned is, uh, so one note is that these improvements are computed over individual super segments and they will accumulate over entire routes. Hence our improvements may quickly become more important on a whole route level. So a super segment may be, and I think they have a data somewhere here. Let me find it. Um, where it is. Okay, here it is. Data set statistics. So you can see that the super segment uh, length is, so average segment length is around like 100 meters, I don't know. Uh, and super segments are around, so average number of segments per super segment is around 20. So that means probably average super segment has around two kilometers. So once you accumulate that over like 10 kilometers, when, when you have multiple super segments, then obviously the errors accumulate and GN start bringing more and more uh, advantage compared to these other baselines. And I mean, obviously Google would not put, put this into production if it wasn't meaningful enough. So yeah, but just don't get confused by the small differences. Now, hopefully it's clear enough. And let's see the ablations. So uh, one thing I have not mentioned is they've experimented with various things. So I did mention the unsupervised loss. So they try, tried using uh, stuff like uh, deep graph info, Infomax. They've also experimented with these combinations of aggregators and like not using just the uh, some aggregator, but using some other uh, types of aggregations. And uh, all of the ideas come from this uh, principal neighborhood aggregation paper. Uh, you can check it out. Yeah, ju just keep in mind that they've experimented with lots of things and they uh, eventually decided not to use many of those ideas in the production because the trade-off was not acceptable. So even though they brought some performance benefits, the cost of kind of serving those more uh, like complex models is uh, way higher. So, um, okay, let's, let's kind of skim over these uh, ablations. Um, I mentioned those uh, embedding vectors. So aside from the uh, domain uh, knowledge that was ingrained via those speeds and times in the feature vectors, we had the uh, learnable portion. And you can see that actually using um, like both both embeddings, both the segment level embeddings as well as the super segment embeddings uh, brings better results. Uh, don't get confused by this column, like these acronyms. This stands for New York City, uh, I guess LA, Tokyo, and Singapore. They had to kind of obviously pick a subset of the cities. They can't evaluate this on the whole on a global scale. Um, and you can see results are always better when you're using the embeddings. That's that's kind of clear. Uh, second thing here is. They showed how the uh, meta gradient and EMA are reducing the variance in the, during the training. So we can see on the x-axis here, uh, basically training iterations. On the y-axis, we see the RMSE metric, and we can see that when we are just using Atom with no uh, EMA and no meta gradients, you can see that just the the red curve is kind of getting crazy here. And once you start adding uh, EMA and meta gradients, they show that the blue curve, so using both of these uh, is the best uh, thing to do. And they show that not only for, they just show for it for Tokyo and they show it also for, for LA here. And I just made a note here. So basically it'd be interesting to see how a uh, learning rate evolves over the duration of the training. Uh, so that means I'd love to see the, the like the, how the meta gradient is tuning the learning rate. Can we see some interesting patterns there? Uh, like those types of visualizations in the appendix would be super appreciated. And secondly, be interesting to understand which other schedules did they try with Adam uh, before deciding to go with meta gradients. Uh, let's wrap up the ablation studies. Um, they experimented with these uh, extended super segments and extended super segments plus extra features, whereby uh, they, they were using uh, additional segments, uh, hence the extended super segments, but they were still predicting only the like traversal times for these segments in our original super segment. And they basically showed that all of that kind of helps, uh, but like it's uh, very, it's very expensive, uh, both memory wise and I guess inference wise. And so they decided not to use this in the production setting. Um, here you can see the unsupervised loss I mentioned. So this is the deep graph Infomax paper. This is the, uh, I guess, uh, auto encoder. So graph auto encoder, I guess, paper. And so you can see that those two are, again, improving results across various cities and various horizons. Uh, so both for New York City, LA, etc., for different horizons. But the, the trick here is 
uh, and this is a insert uh, excerpt from this paper. So the uh, the optimal variant and hyperparameters were different for each region and prediction horizon. Thus, it is likely expensive to tune such losses for all existing regions and each horizon. So as I said, you're going to be using various different GNNs depending on the region. So if you have additionally have to tune uh, these uh, kind of hyperparameters, it's going to be hard uh, and expensive. And so they decided not to use them in the actual production setting. Uh, finally, let's see uh, this, these results. So um, using various different uh, aggregation functions like the sum is the actual the one that's used in production but they also try the square root uh, the mean the, the mean the max and all of them combined and as you can see uh, usually this all of them combined uh, like gives you additional performance but again you ha you have to once you're in a production setting this is engineering you have to trade off the costs and so they stick with the sum function they also did this online evaluation of a gn compared to the baselines and they showed it's again better same as in the offline setting we just saw so a couple of things that bug me there is uh, so they mentioned that computed over all tracks within a week, specifically January 15th through January 22nd. What is not clear to me is what it means over all tracks. So did they actually average the results uh, across every single region they are, they, are, they are covering or what? So this, this, kind, this part kind of bugs me. So yeah, not sure about it. Um, and again, I said the results are, are nice, but like uh, basically uh, we don't have a gut feeling for what these small improvements mean. And so A, it'd be nice to have a, like a something like, hey, when you're using this model, it's gonna save you up that many seconds or minutes compared to this baseline. So that would be much more intuitive, we'd have a much better intuitive understanding of what's going on here. Secondly, uh, and I noted it here, basically some type of geographical heat maps uh, where we'd see, depending on the region, uh, like what the performance differences are, that'd be super nice uh, visualization, I guess. Finally, they did the last evaluation on this particular uh, route in LA, I think, and uh, they show certain results. And I have a same remark here. It's not intuitive what these uh, these curves mean. Like, I mean, you can see that the GN, so this uh, th this uh, graph neural network model, is way better. Uh, way better. I mean, it's it's better compared to real time baseline. But I, I don't have a gut feeling for what this means. And so, yeah, that kind of sucks. And also, they don't have any units. I mean, units here. Uh, and so I, I guess it's seconds, but it's kind of not, not clear enough. And so they here also show for the, uh, when, when we have results for the horizon, uh, like for one hour from, from now, uh, you can see that this uh, GN that was trained with that horizon is way better compared to the GN that was trained with the horizon equal to zero. So that's uh, kind of argument behind why do we need all of these multiple horizon GNM models and we are combining them to actually uh, serve the, the results, the end results. I'm gonna end it up here, and uh, I'm gonna just briefly mention that this is a thing that's running in production, which means that research was only a small portion of this whole project, and there were many uh, engineering challenges they had to solve. So one of them was, so they had to obviously cache results. So as they say here, the path in an ETA request usually includes multiple super segments and making predictions for these super segments on the fly is not practical nor scalable. So they have they had to kind of cache the results and then periodically refresh the all of the uh, the cache and they uh, so that's one of the engineering details. Uh, second thing they mentioned here for less frequently visited road segments, we use simpler per segment models. So they drop to simpler baselines in certain regions. So it's a complex system. There are many components, so the meta gradient, the EMA, the graph neural networks, all of this engineering tricks to make this work. And I think it's a, a very impactful uh, project. I mean, I use Google Maps all the time, so I really love this paper. I think it's a clear, clearly written paper, aside from a couple of these remarks and maybe the, the lack of appendix section. Hopefully you liked this video, if you did, share it out with a friend, subscribe to this channel, hit that bell icon, uh, also join the Discord community, there is a lot of engagement happening there, uh, cool people interested in, in ML uh, helping each other out, so yeah, do check it out and until next time, bye bye.